Today's psychological analysis video is of Robert Thompson and John Venables who kidnapped, tortured and killed two-year-old James Bulger. Just before I do begin this analysis, I do want to highlight that most of what I'm going to be saying is based on scientific research and it comes from a place of logic and fact. However, I was a mother of a two-year-old boy in the year that James Bulger was killed. This was a place that I'd grown up in. I had actually took my son to that shopping centre. I still feel very strong emotions about the case and I want to vehemently condemn what they did to James Bulger. There are two sides of the debate. Um, on one side, we've got the emotive and the other side, we've got the factual. These were only children themselves and they couldn't have fully understood the consequences of their actions and I do just want to make it clear so as that you don't get halfway through this video and start commenting saying that I'm wrong or you know I'm wrong in the way that I'm presenting it. I did find it incredibly difficult to cover this case. It is sometimes very difficult to separate emotions from scientific fact and what scientific research says about children who kill. Denise Bulger had taken her two-year-old son, James, to a shopping mall. She let go of his hand for just a second to get some change out of her purse. Then two-year-old James was gone when she turned around. The CCTV from the shopping centre shows that two older boys led James away, taking hold of his hand. They'd been playing truant and they'd stolen sweets and toys from several shops that morning. They tried to get another young boy, but his mother had caught them in time. Both of the boys took part in leading James away. More than 30 people seen them talking to James and taking him away crying, but nobody challenged them. Robert Thompson's upbringing was fairly dysfunctional. Robert, his mother and his siblings were all subjected to verbal physical and sexual abuse at the hands of their father. It was very turbulent, his upbringing, and it, he had that violent father who'd left their family home about four years before the boys killed. However, once his father had left their home, the bullying and the violence continued. The brothers were turning on themselves and bullying and hitting each other. In the week after the dad left, for the family home burnt down in an accidental fire. And Thompson did find it incredibly difficult to cope and so she turned to alcohol. She would often leave the children home alone so that she could go out drinking. Robert Thompson often played truant. At the age of 10, he'd missed around half of his formal education and nothing had been formally done about that. This is a typical family background, though, that we see with violent rapists, murderers and serial killers. Thompson didn't have any discipline at home. He was beaten and he was abused by the people who were meant to protect him. There were no protective factors in his life. His mother was unable to provide for him with guidance and protection and pretty much abandoned the children to drink and forget her worries. Once his abusive father had left, his older brothers began hitting and hurting each other. The beatings flowed down the ages in a hierarchy with Robert pretty much at the bottom of it. He hadn't had much formal structure in place at his school either. He'd played truant so much that he'd never learned to abide by the rules and have structure in his life. On the other hand, Venables didn't suffer any violence at home though. He wasn't known to have been bullied at school at any point. If anything, it's recorded that he was the one who was more likely to bully other people. Although they weren't a wealthy family, they were more financially stable than Thompson's family. Venables was one of three children. He had a younger sister and an older brother, both of whom had learning difficulties and they attended specialist schools. His parents had separated, but they both co-parented and both of them spent time with their children. It's been reported that John did take that separation quite badly. John's mum, Susan, had suffered from psychiatric problems and would frequently complain of feeling overwhelmed with parenting. 
Venables had only been at his new school for one year before killing James. He'd moved schools because his behaviour at his previous school had become worse and worse. He used to revolve around, along the walls, pulling down all the other students' work. He would curl up under a desk so that nobody could reach him. He stuck paper all over his face with glue. He'd cut himself with scissors and also cut holes in his uh, socks and in his clothing. Finally, the final straw for him was that he tried to choke another boy by holding a ruler over his throat. So he was expelled for that and went to a new school. With John Venables, we don't see the chaotic family life that Robert Thompson had. However, we do see more aggressive and disruptive behaviour than Robert. There were many behavioural indicators that Venables would escalate onto more serious forms of violence in his life. We know that his parents had split up and that had upset him a great deal. However, there was less poverty and there was more structure in his life. Venables had an older brother and a younger sister who had learning difficulties. I personally suspect that he felt somewhat invisible at home. Children with learning difficulties take up much more of a parent's time than children who don't have these extra needs. So at his previous school, there were reports of acting out and ripping down work off the wall. He'd hide underneath the desk and stick paper all over his face. And that indicates to me that he felt unseen, unnoticed. He's acting out to get attention and even negative attention is better than none for him. When Venables moved school, he became friends with Thompson. On the day that they murdered James, they went to the Strand Shopping Centre in Liverpool. They'd stolen sweets, a troll doll, some batteries and a can of blue paint. They were playing truant off school as they usually did. Before they took James, they tried to take another little boy, but fortunately their mother caught them in time. One of the main motivations for violence in general is to gain some control and to exert power over someone or something. Coming from chaotic family homes can lead to feelings of powerlessness and a lack of control. By acting out in violent ways, they were perhaps gaining that power and control that they were previously missing in their life. On the day that they took him, they led James on a two and a half mile walk towards the canal, where Thompson and Venables joked about pushing James in along the canal as they walked. They were seen by several people and they entered a number of shops before leading James up to the railway embankment and that is where they tortured and killed him. They threw modelling paint in his eye, kicked him, stamped on him, threw bricks at him and placed batteries in his mouth. They dropped a heavy metal pipe on him, fracturing his skull in 10 places. James had a total of 42 injuries. All of those injuries contributed to his death. Thompson and Venables then laid his body across the railway tracks and weighted it down with rubble. A train ran over his body, severing it in half. James's body was discovered two days after he went missing. The police had suspected that there was an sexual element to the murder because James's shoes, socks, trousers and underpants had all been removed. When the pair were arrested and questioned, they both denied it initially. Forensic contests, though, confirmed that both boys had the same blue paint on their clothing as was found on Jane Bulger's body. Both of them had blood on their shoes. The blood on Thompson's shoe was matched to Bulger's DNA through tests. A pattern of bruising on James Bulger's right cheek matched the features of the upper part of a shoe worn by Thompson. A paint mark in the toe cap of one of Venable's shoes indicated that he must have used some force when he kicked James Bulger. Thompson is said to have asked the police whether the two-year-old had been taken to hospital, in his words, to get him alive again. Bulger had been abducted from that shopping mall. He'd been repeatedly assaulted and then he was left to run over by a train. The public were understandably outraged and they labelled these boys as evil monsters who should never be released from prison.
At their trial, there were 500 protesters outside the court. The public and the media called for justice and everybody wanted to seek hard punishments, harsh punishments and a life imprisonment for the murder of a child. As I said earlier, I had a two-year-old boy at the time that this was in the press and it occurred in an area that I lived as a child and so I too wanted to have justice for James Bulger. It evoked a very strong emotional response in me. As a mother, I condemned those boys. Take a look at the clip from the courthouse. The people in these crowds outside the courthouse are adults calling for these children to be killed because they killed a child. The trial was conducted as an adult trial and the focus of it was on the severity of the crime rather than the age and the competency of the offenders. John Venables had flashbacks and nightmares of giving birth. He blamed it all on Robert Thompson until two years after being sentenced. Robert Thompson demanded a new doctor and he didn't talk to her until she only agreed to write down minimal details. Only then did he tell her and admit his guilt. He still didn't give her all of the details because he said that it wasn't sorted in his own mind. Five years after sentencing, he did fully admit and accept what he'd done. There are so many people who have a lot to say about this case, perhaps very understandably so. Some are articles looking into their upbringing and blaming their parents. Both mothers had difficulties. One was an alcoholic and the other one had depressive episodes and also left their young children home alone when they were fairly young. There have been lots of theories put forward as to why the boys killed in the way that they did. Some say that they simply learned this aggressive behaviour from their parents. Others are saying that it was the school's fault for not safeguarding these children appropriately. They had, after all, missed a substantial amount of schooling due to them both plain truant. There are elements of truth in all of these suggestions. However, what kind of stumped me is that this is an isolated episode that didn't occur in any context of any more prolonged, violent or sadistic behaviour. This was perhaps a very fluid crime. And what I mean by that is I don't think there was any kind of a plan in place once they successfully led James away. There'd been some suggestion that the boys had made a plan to take a child that morning. They failed to take one young boy because they were caught by his mother. It's possible that they actually didn't know what they were going to do with James once they were outside and banter between the two of them led to suggestions along the lines of getting rid of the evidence. I think throughout the crime, they were using James as a vehicle for their anger, frustration and aggression. Now, we can't look at this crime in the same way as we would look at adults who kill. These were children themselves. Both of them were only 10 years old. Their thought processes and motivations are going to be immature. Sure, they'd had difficulties at home. Robert Thompson had been a victim of violent behaviour at home and John Venables resented his parents for splitting up and perhaps maybe felt unseen at home because his siblings had learning difficulties. However, there are plenty of other children who've experienced these kinds of conditions and don't go on to commit such horrific acts as this. Whenever a child carries out a violent act, we always begin by looking to the parents and, in a sense, blaming them. Even the judge in this case laid the responsibility very firmly at the feet of their parents. He called for a public debate about the wider ramifications of the crime and trial, and he stated that the, the home background, upbringing, family circumstances, parental behaviour, and the relationships were all needed in the public domain so that informed and worthwhile debate can take place for the public good in the case of grave crimes by young children. In the days after the arrest of John Venables and Robert Thompson, their mothers were attacked and they were vilified in the street. They were placed in protective custody 
However, I know that Robert Thompson's mother and his siblings were placed with care workers who had no experience in this area. This had a massive impact on those workers because they weren't allowed to even tell their families that his family was there. These workers were given no support or no counselling to deal with the fact that they were there either. Many of these workers had children and grandchildren who were a similar age to James. Just moving away from this case for a moment, what we do know in general about children who kill is that they're very likely to be victims themselves. Many children who kill have experienced dysfunctional upbringings and traumatic events. Research suggests that child murderers don't fully understand the severity or the implications of their crimes. Children might know that certain behaviours are wrong, but only as a result of what adults have taught them and not because they really understand the moral arguments behind them. Morality and the finality of death are known as abstract concepts and most children under 12 are only able to reason and solve problems and ideas that can be represented concretely. It isn't until puberty that the ability to reason with abstract concepts such as these begin to develop. In other words, they lacked the ability to think logically about hypothetical situations. Prepubescent children aren't fully emotionally developed. They're less able to use self-control and less able to appreciate the consequences of their actions. When children kill, they're treating their victim as a target and as an outlet for their violence. Children's brains aren't fully formed. This is a major reason why most countries have a minimum age of criminal responsibility. Compared to most adults, children have impaired decision making, impulse control, long term thinking and may be unable to fully understand the consequences of their actions. They have worse decision making skills than adults. And this is partly because their frontal lobes, which govern executive functions such as planning, working memory and impulse control, are amongst the last of the areas in the brain to mature. And these areas may not be fully developed until halfway through their 20s. In other words, brains aren't fully grown until somebody's in their mid 20s. This is a major reason, as I said, why countries have a minimum age of criminal responsibility. In England and Wales, the age of criminal responsibility is set as 10. Some experts have called this ridiculously young. In no other country in Europe can such young children be prosecuted for an offence, with the age of legal criminal responsibility set at 15 in Norway, 14 in Germany, 16 in Portugal and 18 in Luxembourg. If you listen to the audio recordings of the police interviews with these boys, Thompson and Venables sound incredibly young and immature. What time was that? When was that? I don't know. So what did... John what happened? I don't know. He, he, he grabbed up the baby's hand and just walked around the strand. And then he let him go loose then. Did he? When we were by the church, he let him go. And you were with John then? You shook your head? You shook your head? Yeah. I told him to take him back. You did as well? I told him to take him back. You told him to take him back? Know, all right, <laughs> No, so you're not getting all the blame. We're just asking your son. We're yeah, trying to find Bobby, the truth. Yes, Bobby, you always get the blame. Wait a minute, Bobby. Listen. <laughs> Just, just calm yourself down for a minute, okay? You all right? Yeah. In James Bulger's murders, the focus really is on the severity of the crime rather than the age and competency of the offender. Thompson and Venables had been plastered as evil and touched by the devil across many media tabloids. Whilst that type of reaction makes sense at a very emotional level, it doesn't fit with a fair and impartial criminal justice system. This extensive media coverage led Thompson's solicitor to argue that because of the widespread reporting on this case, the jury could be prejudiced, making the trial unfair. 
However, the judge ruled that this wouldn't influence the trial and it should continue as it was planned. However, public animosity was fueled by the media and this was able to permeate the whole case. Less than a year after Thompson and Venable's trial ended, there was a murder in Norway that was very similar to the Bulger case. A five-year-old girl had been found dead. She was killed by two six-year-old boys. The way in which the crime was approached by the legal system and by the public was starkly different to that of the Bulger case. In Norway, the age of criminal responsibility is 15 years old. The children were never named and photos of them were never released to the press. They were never arrested. Instead, they were enrolled at kindergarten with close follow-up from involved professionals. Child psychologist Tron Anderson, who was involved in their case, spoke about the brain and how it restructured during puberty. Only then do these frontal lobes begin to function in what he described as an adult way. He suggests that the boys involved in that killing of the five-year-old girl may have been able to understand the difference between what is right and what is wrong, but the children don't have the brain or the psychology to be able to take full responsibility for their actions. In conclusion for today then, Robert Thompson did have a difficult and volatile upbringing. He had difficulty at school and he missed a lot of schooling through playing truant. However, John Venable's family life, that was much more stable with both parents taking an active role in his upbringing. His parents had separated and he had two siblings with additional needs. I believe that both children feel unseen and they lacked emotional intelligence. It's highly likely that both of them felt anger and animosity and they didn't know how to express it. Thompson had only moved school a year before the killing because of his aggressive and disruptive behaviour at the previous school. Thompson and Venables formed a toxic relationship that led to deviant acts such as skipping school and stealing from shops. Although Venables had a worse upbringing than Thompson, it was Robert Thompson who was displaying more trouble and behaviour in school before they went on to kill. The actions that they took on that day were most likely to have been unstructured and not well planned. They most likely didn't know what to do with James once they had him. They walked a fair distance with James before killing him. They'd taken such a small young boy because they were better able to overpower and to control him. What they did to young James is completely unthinkable for any parent, in fact for anyone. I can't even give you any idea as to who did what actions and abuse towards James and even give you a direct answer as to why they did it. Only Thompson and Venables would be able to tell you that. What I can tell you though is that there's an overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that they weren't fully able to appreciate the gravity of their actions because both of them were so young. It was the level of press this case received and headlines labelling them monsters or evil that led them to being treated like adults and having their names released. The understandable public outcry was fuelled by sensational headlines and the level of press coverage that it received. If this were to happen in any other Western country, their names would never have been released and they wouldn't have been tried in an adult court. There are still strong emotions linked to this case, with most people saying that they've never been completely punished for what they did. They were placed in a young offenders institute and that meant they had access to gyms, swimming pool, education, gaming consoles and more. The focus in these places is to rehabilitate behaviour and attitudes so that eventually the young people can be released back in society and act as functioning adults. There have been calls for the two of them to never be released from prison and that they should be moved into an adult prison or even killed. They've both been released from custody in 2001 at the age of 18 and they were both given new identities. As far as I know, Robert Thompson hasn't reoffended since he was released. John Venables, on the other hand, has since reoffended. In 2008, Venables was arrested on suspicion of a fray after a drunken brawl, but charges were later dropped for that. 
He was given a caution for possession of cocaine after he was found with a small amount of it a year later. In 2010, he was found guilty of downloading and distributing pornographic images of children. He was arrested and sentenced to 40 months in 2017 after allegedly being caught with indecent images of children again. He's since been refused parole and official documents have stated that on the outside he finds it difficult to make friends or gain employment and he seeks out drink, sex and pornography as a way of adding excitement to his life and that's a potent mix. The report then goes on to say that Venables thinks about sex a lot. He has a problem maintaining relationships and feels a lack of fulfilment in life and has a need for excitement. If you do want to learn more about criminal psychology and offender profiling, I do have a range of courses available online on my website. Or if you would like to support me on Patreon, which can be a small gesture such as buying me a coffee, I would be extremely grateful and it would mean that I can continue to bring you these free videos. So that's it for today then. I hope that you've enjoyed this psychological analysis of Robert Thompson and John Venables. More importantly, I do hope that you've learned something new from it. Thanks for watching then. Bye for now.